Awesome. I want to read the text for this morning. And are y'all excited to be at church today? It's going to be a good day. I want to read uh, from Acts 3, and um, we're going to be in this. By the way, we're reading Acts uh, this semester as a church. So if you've got a Bible, you can open it up. It'll be on the screen as well. It says, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. And at three in the afternoon, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put every day to beg from those that were going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Everybody say money. Money. Asking for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. Have you ever told your kids this or told somebody, look, would you look at me? Okay, look at me. I do this with Zane. I like grab him, grab my face. He's like doing, you know, kind of looking away. Look at us. He's, He's asking for eye contact. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him, and helped him up and instantly, y'all say instantly, instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong and he jumped to his feet, he began to walk and then He went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. Let's pray that God would speak to us today. God, as we open your word, would you open our hearts Open our eyes and our ears to see and hear what you want us to see and hear today. God, I pray that you would transform us, every person here today. God, from the inside out, we want to live for you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said. Amen. Did anybody watch the Razorbacks yesterday? Raise your hands. Okay, that, I prayed for all y'all yesterday, all right? Because during the second quarter, I know y'all was acting a fool, all right? And uh, I, was, I was up here trying to study and watch the Razorback game, which is an awful combination, by the way, because your, your excitement's all over the place. And um, woo pig, okay, we're excited for a 3-0 start. If we can win next week, it'll be, it'll be really good, okay? We need to start praying and fasting right now. All right. Uh, I want to ask you a question this morning as we get ready to uh, dive into this. Have you ever in your life got more than you expected? Anybody? Have you ever got more than you asked for? Maybe you purchased something online or you ordered something on Amazon. It came with like an extra little goodie. Y'all know that feeling, right? There's a sticker in there and you're like excited about the sticker. It's like, it's a sticker, right? More than you asked for. Maybe uh, you, you did a Walmart delivery. I know some of you do some Walmart deliveries and and if you, let, you spend less money, right? You don't go to Walmart. They just bring it to your house because you don't look at all the stuff. But when, you're, when the delivery gets to your house, you actually got the delivery for a family of like 14, okay? And they got, they, but it, praise God. I'm like, I'm, God, please do that to our house right now in Jesus' name. Way more than you asked for. Or maybe you bought a, a motorcycle and it came with a neck brace. You know, like, I, may, I'm kidding, okay? <laughs> kidding. Y'all grow up, grow up. All right. Just making sure you're awake this morning. Um, our family was in Branton um, last week. We went and watched the, the Jesus play thing, and, and, um, and it was awesome. And, and when we went up there, we went to this place. It's called Billy Gale's Restaurant. Have any of you been to that? It's, they've got these gigantic pancakes. If you haven't been, I encourage you to go check it out. Um, I was hungry, and, and I ordered three of these pancakes. We don't throw that picture of the pancake up there. It's 14 inches wide. It's like an inch thick in the middle, and I got, we got like triple stacks of these smothered in like peanut butter and syrup and chocolate chip. It was awesome. Uh, I had like four bites, and I was done for. I got, I got way more than I asked for, and on the way to uh, this little getaway, um, my, my wife looks at me in the car, and she said, Seth, by the way, Zane is getting a pet turtle this week. And I was like, what? You know, like we discussed pets as a family. And, and she, uh, she began to tell me that her older brother that was meeting us there was bringing a turtle. And uh, would you show that picture of the turtle? Um, this is my son. And he got, he, got a, he got a pet turtle, this little tiny turtle. Everybody say, oh, um, the turtle died. Uh, I just want to spoil it. So um, I don't know if it died. I don't know. I'm just kidding. But it disappeared. All right. So 
I, pr- I started praying. I'm like, God, I- I'm not cut out to be a turtle dad, you know, like I, whatever you got to do to remove this turtle, just make it happen, you know? So I was joking about it like around the family and y'all, I'm not kidding. We woke up, it had like a turtle, like habitat, turtle food, like a little, it was like a whole turtle club, you know? And, and uh, we woke up the next morning and it was outside the front door because it kind of smelled, okay? Like if you got animals like that, they kind of have a smell to them. So it was out front and we go to leave and Zane, you know, was excited about the turtle and he look, we look in there and the turtle is gone. Hasta mañana. Like he's gone. And uh, the turtle food has been eaten. And so I've never thanked the Lord for a raccoon until that very moment. And I was like, man, that's sad. You know, I'm like, yeah. So the whole family thought I did something. Like the whole family thought I snuck out at like 2 a.m. and threw the turtle in the woods, you know. That's like messed up. I just want to let you know. I confess in front of you today, I did not do that. The raccoon heard from God. So uh, (laughs) uh, today, I want you to write this down. Uh, The title of today's message is, is more than I could ever ask for. More than I could ever ask for. We see a man in this text in chapter 3 of Acts that receives way more than he could ever ask for. Would y'all agree? He's begging for money and receives a miracle in his life. And all the way through the book of Acts, we're going to see this this semester. We may be in the book of Acts until this time next year, depending on what God wants to do, all right? It's a powerful, powerful um, chapter of of Scripture in chapter 3. God does exceedingly and abundantly more than than he could ask, think, or imagine. He didn't even know what to ask for. And so as we're walking through the book of Acts as a church, we see a powerful act of God. We we see an incredible move of faith. And and we see, honestly, a response of how we should respond when God moves in our life. And we'll explain that here in a second. So in this uh, series that we're doing, we're going to study the nature of the early church. And uh, studying what God moved them, how God moved them from being a ragtag group of guys, right? These are the disciples. They're pretty jacked up and and messed up people. And and this ragtag group becomes the most powerful movement on the planet. And we're sitting here today as a byproduct of their belief and their, their actions and what happens in the book of Acts. If we want to understand what gave this community of believers in Acts the, the power, then, then we've got to look at their core beliefs. I want you to write this down. We have to look at their core beliefs, and we have to look at the actions that followed their beliefs. Because how many of you would agree it's one thing to believe, it's another thing to act upon your belief? Would you all agree? So they believed, and they had enough faith that they acted upon their belief, and it wasn't the way that they were recognized in the community that gave them power. Nor was it a strategy or a social media marketing plan or a six-step program or a 12-step program. Their eloquence of speech, a great sermon or message. It wasn't a catchy church name. It wasn't the way they responded to persecution, even though these things were part of it. It wasn't a mission statement or their goals or their dreams and aspirations. This is what it was. It was what they believed was true about Jesus. Don't miss this and the actions that directly followed that. It was what they believed was true about Jesus and the actions that directly followed that in faith. It's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This story in Acts 3, it's the first apostolic miracle, which is a miracle performed by the disciples, now the apostles, and that God is using his power through these men and, and we see this beautiful picture. You've got to get this today. I think they're going to throw it up on the screen. The gospel brings compassion for the hurting, restoration for the broken, repentance for the sinner, and refreshment for all who are saved. Would you all agree, man, that's good news. Like, that's, that makes me happy in my soul. Early in my walk with Jesus, I, I remember reading this passage of Scripture, being a little confused, but I, I used to think that, man, I'm, I'm in this story, I'm like Peter and John. Right? We can read this story. We're like, oh, you know, I've got something to offer. I can help other people up, and, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But the reality is I wasn't Peter and John. I was the crippled beggar. Anybody else? Like, I was down in a bad place in my life, as broken as can be, and, and I thought that I was capable of pulling other people to their feet, but the reality is I was pulling them down to my position. My inability to see my own brokenness was the very thing that kept me broken for many years of my life. 
and my inability to see my own sin, it, it kept me entangled in sin. It's like I could never get out. My inability to understand the condition that I was in, it kept me in that condition. This man in this text was no different because here's the thing. He knew what, would, what condition he was in, but he did not understand his deepest need. He knew the physical condition he was in, but he did not understand his deepest need, which was this, to be transformed from the inside out. To be transformed. He, he thought he knew what he needed, but he didn't know what he needed. Before this miracle takes place, we see some powerful stuff. Uh, Pastor Bronson spoke last week, a good friend of mine. We talked about life groups and community and, and devoting ourselves to the word and all those things up until this point. He, he, he spoke about the waiting of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit moved at the beginning of Acts. It says that 3,000 were saved, transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is what it says, that the believers devoted themselves to the word to fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. If you want to know, how do I do this whole Christian life thing? Start there. <laughs> the word, fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. There was unity in the church. There was power in the church. And the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. So I want to dive into chapter 3. If you've got a Bible, you can open it. It'll be on the screen as well. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple out of the time of prayer. At three in the afternoon, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day, y'all say every day, every single day to beg from those going into the temple courts. This was custom, to go to the temple three times a day. It just so happened to be 3 p.m. at this occurrence, at the time of prayer. This was the time that Jesus was crucified as well, a uh, time before this. And, and it's very symbolic. They're walking up and they're getting ready to get their worship on and pray and something happens. It's very common also to sit outside of the temple and to ask people for money because the people who are going into the temple are most likely going to be generous. Are y'all tracking with me? And so he's asking for money and he gets way more than he could ever have asked for. A man who's crippled from birth He's been carried every day of his life. I just want you to think about this. Never crawled, never walked, never supported his own weight, never ran, never jumped, never done any of those things. He's been carried his entire life. And he's sat there at the temple gate. Just get this picture. He's crippled from birth, he's carried from birth, and he's begging from birth. Over 40 years in Acts 4, it says this man was over 40 years old. That's a long time to be sitting in the same place asking the same question. Would you all agree? So he's here. He's begging. He's, he's never walked. He's never carried his weight. He's never supported his own weight. So therefore, there is no muscle that has been developed in his legs. It's like some of you that just go do upper body at the gym, right? It's <laughs> don't skip leg day, my friend, okay? Interestingly enough, he was at the church house all day long. This crippled man was outside of the church all day, and he remained unchanged. And as I was preparing this message, I thought, man, so many people are, are in this camp. Now, I go to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Tuesday, you know, whatever, whatever you do, church, I go to this group and that group, I do this and I do that. But maybe you leave every time unchanged, unfazed. Like nothing is different. Like, like you believe something, but the actions that follow don't show that you do. This man is unchanged. He sits in this place, a beautiful gate. It's a 75 foot tall Corinthian bronze or a brass gate, and, and, and it's beautiful. They got really creative with the name. They just said, we'll call it the beautiful gate, okay? And he's sitting here asking for money. And I, I just imagine this guy's like, if I ask 10 people for money, surely someone will give me something. And so Peter and John walk onto the scene, and something crazy happens. This man was lame from birth. Everybody say lame. I grew up in Jacksonville. And uh, we used to call people lame on the playground. Now I know how insulting that is, okay? <laughs> Lameness is this. It is the inability to walk 
or have movement due to pain, injury, or past illness. In this passage, we see a physical condition, but what you need to know as we set this whole thing up is that it actually represents a spiritual condition. It is a physical condition that represents a spiritual condition. And here's the truth. In 31 years of life, I have been lame in many areas of my life. I have been able to get up in many areas of my life and refuse to get up. Has anybody been there with me? Like, like I've been lame before. There's all types of lameness, by the way. And I'm not talking about someone who was born a certain way or ha- does not have the ability to do some of these things. I'm talking about a choice of lameness. And this is what is set up in this text. That maybe, maybe it's the mentally lame. Where somebody does not have the cognitive capacity to take on responsibility. So therefore, I'm not going to receive any correction. I'm going to do what I want, and I'm going to remain lame. Maybe it's physically lame. Where someone neglects the temple of God, which is your body, by the way, okay? It's not the four walls of this place. It is your body. And I'm going to neglect the temple of God. This is a physical lameness. And maybe it's overeating or undereating or whatever it may be that you do to yourself, but it's a, it's a physical lameness. Financially, this may step on some toes. This is where someone neglects the, the responsibility and they refuse to take responsibility for their financial situation. And so instead of changing and, and maybe applying the principles of God's word to their life, they neglect it overall. They continue the same spending habits and expect a different result. That's called insanity, by the way. Or maybe it's socially lame. I would even say that this one can be said that it's lame hands and lame feet. It's the refusal to work. And this is for those who are physically capable of working. And so instead of working, I choose to be lame, and I want another person or the government to provide what God told me to provide. I could see the tension is rising in the room. The last one is the spiritually lame. This happens to many men and women, and I see this a lot in the world we live in today with men. In the household, by the way, this generation that is coming up is known as a fatherless generation, where there are more children being raised by a single parent, and and I'm just saying it's the world we live in. It's known as a generation where it's more likely to be divorced than than married after you get married. The spiritually lame, this is where the woman of the household has to lead spiritually because the husband chooses to be spiritually lame and they refuse to get up and walk towards Christ. They refuse to lead their family towards the things of God and and heaven and they, they go the opposite direction. And now that the room is as tense as possible, let's talk about what God does here. Amen, are y'all tracking with me? This passage paints the picture of a physical condition and a spiritual need. We see a physical need, but there's a deep spiritual need that this man has. In verse 3, it says, when, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Everybody say money. He asked them for money, and And this is what I realized. If you would have went up to this beggar, any of you, if you went up to this beggar and you said, hey, what's the most that you think you could receive today? He would have probably given a dollar amount. Would y'all agree? He would have probably said maybe a couple hundred bucks or or maybe unlimited camel rides, like ultimate Uber of that day. Like he, he would have probably said, that's probably all I could receive. I guarantee you never in a million years would he say, I think I'm gonna walk today for the first time. I think that I'm actually going to jump. I think that I'm going to run. And and then because of it, because of this miracle, I'm going to tell everyone what God has done for me. I guarantee. Why did he not expect that? He didn't know it was a possibility. His expectation was limited because he didn't know that this was possible for him. And and I want to ask you this this morning. How often in your life is that the same for you? That you don't know what is possible or what is capable in your life. And so you limit what God can do with your life. Hopefully today I can change that up a little bit and and, and maybe present this to you. So often people spend their whole life asking for things and money and more of this and possessions. But God wants to radically change your life. 
So verse 4, it says, Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. And so the man gave them his attention, expecting, here we are, to get something from them. He got way more than he could ever imagine, more than he could ask, more than he could expect. Write this down. The gospel gives more than you could ever ask for, more than you could earn, more than you could imagine. There's so much more on the other side of your yes to following Jesus than you could ever imagine. Verse 6, it says, then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have, what does it say? I give to you. Here we go. This is the audible, okay? Now imagine this. The crippled guy that's asking for money is asking for help, and he says, look at me. The guy looks at him, and then he says, I don't have what you're asking for, but I have what you need. I don't have what you're desperate for today, but I do have what you need. Verse 6, then silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Hold on. Let's just pause here, okay? I think sometimes we'll read the Bible and it's like, oh, that's cute. Like, move on. Like, this dude has never stood up in his entire life. Can we, are y'all tracking with me? Everybody say yes. Like, give me, y'all are alive? Okay. He's never stood up. He's never supported his own weight before. He stands up and he walks. Peter basically says, what you have asked for, I don't have, but what you need, I have complete access to. Some of you, maybe you came here for different reasons today. Can I tell you, I may not have what you want, but I can tell you what you need. I spent a lot of my life chasing things and money and girls and all those things. I could tell you it was fun for a season, but eventually that stuff becomes less fun (laughs) and it doesn't satisfy Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. Write this down. There is power in the name of Jesus. I am so thankful that, that, that Peter didn't say, in the name of Peter, get up and walk. Because if he would have said that, some of y'all would have read that, and y'all would have got way too confident. Like, that's right, you know. He, he didn't say, in the name of John, get up and walk. He didn't say in the name of a church, in the name of New Life Church, get up and walk. He didn't say in the name of the latest celebrity or or pastor or government leader, get up and walk. What did he say in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. This is the savior of the world. This is the redeemer. This is the bread of life, the Lord, the king of kings, our Messiah, our healer, the overcomer, the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace, the mighty God. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Hold up, wait a minute. They just put some Jesus in it, okay? Like, they, the, everything changes right here. This is the pivot point of the entire text. Verse 7, it says, taking him by the right hand. I love this. He helped him up. Would y'all circle that in your Bible or whatever you're writing on? Write it on your neighbor's arm so they'll remember it. He helped him up. And instantly, I love that, circle that word, instantly. Some of you think it's gonna take a long time for you to get your life right and together. Can I tell you, God will meet you right in the middle of your mess? Instantly, instantly, the man's feet and his ankles became strong. Y'all, this jumped off the page this week. And and if what I'm about to say sounds like I'm excited, it's because I am, okay? Immediately, instantly, his feet and his ankles became strong. This was revolutionary for me because I asked the question, why not his hands? Some of y'all are like, Seth, you're stupid, okay? (laughs) Why not his arms? Why not his mind or his head or, or his chest or his biceps? No, he said your feet and your ankles because Jesus, when he starts healing your life, he starts at the weakest place first. And he, he gave him strength in his feet. And then it says his ankle bones became strong, which is really important we understand that there, this is a doctor writing this. So this is, if you look in the original language, he's writing a lot about what's really happening. His ankle bones became strong. Where there was no muscle, now there is muscle. Some of y'all are like, I'm praying that over my life right now. Where there is no muscle, there be muscle in Jesus' name. The area that seemed untouchable in his life was touched by God. 
And now he's a walking, talking miracle. And this is what happens. Can I just say some of you need to hear that today? That God wants to start in the area of your life that's untouchable. You've got it locked away. You won't tell anybody about it. And that's right where the work begins. Verse 8, it says, he jumped to his feet and he began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts. I could just imagine what happened that day. If there's somebody outside of this church and they can't walk, and y'all came in here and we're having church and they walk up in this place because something like this happens, if this church service doesn't change, something's wrong with us. Y'all track it with me? This man was lame and now he's walking with the men who carry the good news of the gospel. Don't miss this. It says that he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. This man's past did not dictate his future. Write this down. Today is the day either to get up or pull up. And I'm going to explain. To get up or to pull up, or maybe both. To get up, what does that mean? Some of you are here today, or maybe someone will stumble across this video. Some of you are here today, and today is your day to get up. Not in your own strength, because you can't get up in your own strength. You can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I don't care what self-help book you're, you're reading or leadership or 12 steps to this or that. Jesus is the one that helps you out of, out of your sin. He picks you up off of the ground. He gives you life. He gives you a new name. That is the only way we find power in the world we live in today. To get up. He, he wants to heal you and forgive you and begin to transform your life. But this is also what I believe is that some of you, you got saved a long time ago. Like you, you put faith in Jesus. You did the prayer. You walked up front. You did all the stuff. And then something happened. Something set in on your life. Something You, you experienced something painful. And I'm not ne negating it. I'm not neglecting it. I'm not saying it didn't happen. But what I can tell you is it's not supposed to keep you on the ground. I need everybody to look at me because I think there's a lot of you here today that this is gonna connect with you. You used to walk with the Lord and something happened. Today is your day to get up. You don't have to have it all figured out, just get up. This is me, I'm reaching my hand out and I'm saying, hey, by the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And you walk into your job and they're gonna be like, oh, Billy's different. <laughs> what happened to Janice, you know? Get up get up. Shame has a really interesting way of keeping you down. Would y'all agree? That's not from the Lord. That's from the enemy. The, the last one I wrote was maybe if you're not getting up, maybe you need to pull up. And what I mean by that is pull someone else up. God didn't get you up so that you could just be up and just live up. He, he said, now go back and rescue people who were lost. Now go back and share your story to the people who need to be found. Help some other people up. Can somebody say amen? Help some people up. I love what Thomas Walker says. This is powerful. He says, the power was of Jesus, but the hand was of Peter. The power was of Jesus, but the hand was of who? Peter. He reached and help this man up. I pray you catch this this morning as a church. I pray that y'all hear me. I pray we start fighting harder than hell. And I'm gonna explain. Harder than hell for people who are lost. And what I mean by that is if the enemy is fighting hard, we should be fighting harder. If the enemy is trying to pull people down into the dominion of darkness and hold people down and bind them up by their sin and cast chains on them and feel heavy, can we pick them up? Can we be a church that ex exemplifies the goodness of God in the community that we live in? I don't want to play church. I'm not trying to be Pinteresting and cute. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. By the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And when you get up, pick some other people up. Well, Seth, why are you excited? It's my only response. Because I'm done being casual about the things of God. I'm done. Well, you're too excited. There's a lot of churches in the city. I want some people who are excited about the things of God, that you get rescued and you start helping some other brothers and sisters up. This is the gospel, to go back and to reach and to rescue. But here's the reality. We have to stop standing at the edge of the cliff and waving at people as they drive off. Hard conversations need to happen with your friends. 
some difficult conversations, and it will probably start by you just serving them, doing some things that God has called you to do. Stop casually allowing the enemy to destroy families and marriages and what marriage is and the kids and the schools around this city. Can we step up? Can we step up? Your Facebook posts are not changing the world. I'm just telling you. People wanna see what you believe in action. That's what happens in Acts. Somebody's like, man, I'm gonna stop posting those Facebook posts. <laughs> Stop casually allowing darkness to creep into your home. Maybe it's you need to shut a show off. Maybe you need to turn some music off that you're letting your kids listen to. I'm not, I'm not saying go burn all the CDs, but what I'm saying is darkness is real and light is real. One of them will rule your home. Can we be the light? Stop treating church as optional and make it the most important part of your week. Make it the charging station for your faith. Stop treating your time with the Lord as optional and make it the way of living. Stop treating serving and giving back as a fantasy and make it your reality. This is what I believe. We got to do this. Y'all, we are all here today because somebody pulled us up. You know their name. I don't know their name. Somebody was led by the Lord to come after you. For some of you, it was your grandmama. And they prayed, and they still need to keep praying because you're pretty jacked up, you know? <laughs> For some of you, it was your parents. Some of you, it was a friend. Some of you, it was your, your, your father or your mother or a sibling or a teacher or a coach. Somebody pulled you up. Can we pull other people up? This is the reality check that, that I think we all need to have. When we got saved, we didn't get a ticket to a cruise ship of Christianity, living a comfortable life, lifestyle, being casual about our faith. God said, here's a ticket to get on the battleship called faith, be a part of the local church and steer towards darkness and be the light. That's what I believe. And that's what I believe God wants us to do in this church. What if our mission in life became this? To, a, to help an entire lame generation get up and walk. What would happen? Can y'all just track with me real quick? What would happen if the entire church, there's a lot of y'all here today and a lot of people here before y'all, and you said, I can't get behind that. I'm gonna help somebody up. I think our city and our church would look different. I think schools and workplaces would look different. I think your home would look different. Because the reality is we are all just beggars showing people where the bread's at. And it's found in Christ. There's three types of people in the story. There's the bystander, there's the Peter, the faith-filled person, and then there's the lame that is laying in whatever condition they're in. For some of you, maybe you are faith-filled and you are going after the things of God and you're helping people to their feet. Can I encourage you, please keep doing that. We need more of that. We need lots of that in the church. Maybe you're here and you're like the lame man and you're in a condition and, and God is wanting to reach out and to pull you to your feet today. This is your day. Get up. But I don't want to miss the other person that's present in the text. There's a bystander. Would y'all agree there's probably some people watching this go down? I bet they look just like this. Hands behind their back, leaned up against the, the big temple gate and they're just sitting there and they're, they're trying to figure out what, what's going on. What's going on? And this is what happens. Ah, oh, man, I, 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 I see a physical need. I see a spiritual need. Somebody else will take care of that. Are y'all tracking with me? Somebody else will help them. Somebody else will pray for them. Bystander, I guarantee you all the bystanders that day, they saw Peter and John, what, they, what happened, and they were like, oh, we better get our stuff together. We're about to go pray and worship and we weren't willing to pray and help someone off the ground. <laughs> and this is what happens in verse eight. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts and walking and jumping and praising God. Bird, I love you, man. I'm so glad that Bird is up here praying. This is a great man. If you haven't met him, I want you to meet him. He says he's, he's jumping and he's praising God. Why so spectacular of a response? This is what I'll say. If you can paint your chest for a Razorback game, 
This is going to step on some toes. And you can cry over the result of, a, of men carrying a piece of pig skin that's aired up. <laughs> and, and if you can get emotional about ESPN and what's on the news and what's on social media, then nobody should stop your praise. I know people who are more emotionally invested in a TV show about one man or one woman and 30 options for a spouse. The Bachelor, <laughs> Bachelorette. You post about it, you cry about it, you tweet about it. It's, a, it's the talk of the town. What if we got just as excited about the things of God? What if we weren't worried or consumed with what other people thought about how we worship the Lord? Are y'all tracking with me? Because I know people who are still consumed with other people's approval that they have never actually stepped out in faith. And I believe that it's going to change. I like football, but I love Jesus. I don't like the bachelor and bachelorette, but I love Jesus, okay? Y'all track it with me? The power of a testimony, verse 9, it says, When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. This is my prayer because we see 3,000 followers of Jesus go to 5,000 followers of Jesus in one moment. Are y'all tracking with me? How did it happen? A man was healed, transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what happens? He shares his story and 2,000 people put faith in Jesus. And you're still debating on sharing your story with your life group, your coworkers or maybe your family. Can we share what God's done? We overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the power of what? The testimony. If God did it, man, tell somebody about what happened. They're filled with wonder and amazement. 5,000 people are now following Jesus. He's gone, by the way. He had resurrected. Testimony was never meant to be kept to ourselves. I can relate with this crippled man a lot because I got, I got kind of tricked. I was asking for one thing, but received a different thing. The thing that got me to New Life Church 11 years ago is I showed up on accident to get, a, they were giving away these little gel watches. It was so cheesy. It was like something you get out of the little claw machine. It had the little logo for the college ministry in Conway. I was neck deep in sin. I was addicted. I was so jacked up and broken. And I showed up to this church. I got three of those watches. <laughs> I came for one thing and left with something else. I got those watches. I got three blue, white, and black. I wish I could find those things. I'd frame them, okay? And I was going to walk out of the church, and this, this girl at the door, she was cute. She's like, you should sit with me. I was like, awesome. You know, <laughs> so, bad intentions, right? It's, <laughs> I go into the service, <laughs> and I show up to the retreat that weekend. I get radically saved. I hear the gospel. What? You may not know, some of you, our church knows this. My father was in prison for a big part of my life and grew up in a really abusive, strange relationship there. I saw a lot, of, a lot of things happen as a kid I don't think anyone should see. And I lived all the way up until around 20 years old not wanting a heavenly father because I had a father wound. And I thought there would be, it'll be a, a cold day in hell, literally, before I forgive my father. I go to this retreat. <laughs> I came for a watch. <laughs> I get radically saved. And I'm on my way home, and my, my father, I got a phone call that my dad was being released from prison the next day. 24 hours after making the biggest decision of my life, I was about to make the next biggest decision, which was forgiving someone who hurt me deeply. And so we showed up, my brother and I, my brother came and spoke a few weeks ago, he's a pastor as well, and we showed up and were able to forgive him and embrace him. And, and I got way more than I ever could have expected, way more than I ever could have imagined. And here's the interesting thing, I want you to get this today, and we're about to close. Jesus started with the weakest part of my life. He started with my feet in my ankles to give them strength so that I could stand up. That day was the day that I felt like the Lord whispered to me, if you can do this, I can trust you to do anything I ask you to do. Forgive your dad. The hardest thing I would ever do in my entire life. And I forgave him. 
It is still a daily deal. I still struggle with this. I still wrestle with this, but I know that it was God. Are y'all tracking with me? What is the area in your life that's off limits to God? And would you be bold enough to give it to him today? Would y'all stand to your feet across the room? I wanna pray for you. Maybe today you're getting strength in your ankles and feet for the first time. This is what it says in Acts 3, 16, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus, everybody say Jesus. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him. As you can all see, repent and turn to God. Your sins will be wiped out and times of refreshing will come from the Lord. Isn't that powerful? Some of you today, what you need to do is turn from the things of this world and fix your eyes on Jesus. Some of you today, God's asking you to get up. Some of you today, God's asking you to start pulling some people up. Are y'all tracking? We all have a response. The gospel always requires a response. I pray that we would respond in faith. If you would close your eyes, I wanna pray for you. And uh, as I'm praying, there's actually gonna be a few people that will be up front. If you need prayer for anything, they're gonna be across the front. They'll be here after service as well. If you need prayer for anything, would you please come and join them in prayer? That pray over family, pray over your kids, pray over your marriage and addiction, whatever it is. There is power in the name of Jesus. Amen.